Welcome to this special edition of the Theology Podcast. Great to have you with us. We have uh, someone we're going to interview today, and we're looking forward to that conversation. But before we jump into it, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves just because we don't assume that people know who we are. Maybe even people who've listened to the show for years don't remember who we are. <laughs> anyway, I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm the pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. And I've done a number of things, including been, uh, invest in commercial real estate, and I've been a professor of philosophy at the college level. But that's enough about me. How about you, Glenn? I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired history professor, senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, ministry associate at Reflections Ministries, run my own ministry called Every Square Inch Ministries, and a few other odds and ends. All right, Tom. I'm Tom Price, a theologian, Christian ethicist. I teach both on the academic and lay level, so a variety of places. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we're joined today by Jason Farley. Jason, great to see you again, and uh, you've got a number of things that you're involved with. Uh, how about introducing yourself? Yeah, Jay, uh, I'm Jason Farley, and I, uh, uh, well, let's see, I am by trade, a writer, comedy writer, um, and screenwriter right now, um, and used to be a pastor, um, but uh, God called me into a different, uh, a different form of ministry, <laughs> different form of comedy, maybe. <laughs> yeah, different form of comedy. Yeah, the divine comedy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, and uh, yeah, work work uh, with a company found helped found a company called Lore TV, which is a, a new um, streaming service that is trying to prove that uh, faith based isn't a genre. Um, okay. Of, of that everything is faith based. It's just a question of which faith, and yeah. that Christians should be working in every genre of filmmaking. So um, I, I am a producer as well, and and then just work in the acquisitions, finding the artists and um, movies and television shows um, that break the mold. Uh, we like to say we're the MTV of Christian entertainment. Um, <laughs> we're 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 breaking the mold of of what people think is Christian entertainment, and um, trying to to uh, expand people's uh, imagination and show that there is a huge audience out there um, that doesn't think that Christians should only be making uh, Hallmark movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fun. That's great stuff to, to hear. Now, you're involved in a few other things, and if you want to talk about those things too, that's great. But uh, I know we have you on to primarily talk about Lore TV. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, also I'm working at what is called Pub University um, with the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, going to be um, building out classes uh, for we, classes that um, help help families live the good life is what we like to say. So uh, the liberal arts uh, classes for uh, adults that look back and say, "Hey, I never got an education." Uh, yeah. And so yeah. we're e starting even with. Yeah, even though maybe you have a bachelor's degree or even a master's degree, you never right. got an yeah. education. Yeah, never, never got it. <laughs> even a doctorate. <laughs> right. Never, never got that uh, education in what it is to be uh, a part of the human race, uh, right. part of the, a part of the great conversation. And so, um, yeah, really excited about that. We're we're just starting this month uh, to build it out. So starting with uh, apologetics classes, uh, theology of uh, theology of the human family. Um, is one of our uh, classes. We've got storytelling classes, finance classes, um, and uh, and then our big our our core class is going to be called the Great Conversation. It's um, and it's just working your way through the uh, the, the big ideas uh, of literature and philosophy um, throughout the history of the we of Western civilization. So I'm I'm really excited about that as well. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, let's jump into streaming. Uh, I guess, entertainment, film, uh, channels, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm the novice here. You can fill me in on the proper terminology. But it seems as though some things are happening in the world of, uh, I guess, entertainment uh, or education or whatever you want to use as the label that really are opening up some possibilities. Can you kind of fill us in on that? Yeah, well, for for a lot of years, there were just the, the four – 
um, channels of television and theaters. And that's all that there was. And then, you know, rentals, VHS rentals, DVD rentals as well. And it was there, there were just a handful of, of what we called avenues of distribution for, uh, for media and entertainment. And they had very powerful, large gatekeepers. You know, um, at one point there were five, people in the world that shows 98% of what made it in, in wow. front of, uh, America. Um, and so, and, and now there's really about, about seven people that still, um, show, you know, most of the, that decide on most of what goes, um, into the movies and television that makes, makes it either onto the, to the big screen or onto, into people's houses. Um, but the possibility because of the technological advancements, the possibility is there for there to be something similar to the cable revolution, uh, of the, the nineties, uh, again, where you went from four channels to a you know, hundred channels over the course of just a few years. And it made it possible for all kinds of new, uh, new niche entertainment avenues to, grow up. Well, what happened though, was then those four channels just started buying up all of them and, right. and we're yeah. back to just a handful, uh, four, four five, maybe six different, uh, avenues uh, of, of distribution because you've got, you know, Disney, Hulu, ESPN, discovery channel, all owned as one conglomerate, ABC, and they're all yeah. one conglomerate again. So, um, but the technology is now, uh, available, to have all kinds of things grow and develop. And so I've been working uh, with the company Lore TV to develop a distribution channel that um, for conservative Christian entertainment um, that w right now, most uh, everything that we call faith-based, um, the money comes from Hollywood and they basically have been paying Christians to stay in a particular lane when they Got say, it. here's here's what faith-based, what we're going to count as faith-based entertainment. And yeah. it all has to do, so they don't mind stories about conversion. They don't mind stories about you know people learning to deal with cancer, um, with God, and stories about puppies and horses and <laughs> those sorts of things. But right. they don't. But they haven't allowed the kind of entertainment um, that either comes in, you know, arguing against whatever idols um, there are in the culture, um, or entertainment um, about what it looks like for for Christians to take dominion in all kinds of other areas of life. They've been paying us to stay in a particular lane and reinforce the idea that religion is something that happens, you know, in your heart, uh, maybe in your head some too, but it doesn't really affect the way society and, and culture runs. And so we're trying to find those artists that, that uh, get out there and, and serve an audience in all the other genres in a way and, and embody a Christianity that is much more muscular and, um, yeah, this reminds me of a couple culture things. changing. A couple of things, uh, Jason. One is this reminds me of a conversation we had not too long ago with Kemper Crab. Uh, yep. Kemper, you know, had the same experience in the in the seventies, uh, where he was one of the kind of the pioneers of uh, what now is called CCM, yeah, you know, or was, and uh, he had the same experience because uh, there were large labels that were interested in him, but only as kind of a Christian guy. You right, know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's that's fascinating. The other thing yeah, is, the, you know, when we Chris, when, Chris go, go ahead. The go difference ahead. Yeah. there was it was Christian labels. It wasn't. Right. It wasn't somebody outside. It was the Christian labels that only wanted a certain kind of thing. Yeah. Well, this yeah. brings up the the other thing I was going to get at, which is, do you find yourself having a hard time kind of pushing up against maybe a particular kind of Christian that thinks in those terms too? Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of my favorite stories and one that I tell a lot of uh, Christian artists is about Keith Green. If you remember Keith oh, Green yeah. as yeah. he was part of the CCM and he got assigned to a label who they and they came to him and they said that they had developed what they called the JPM score, the Jesus per minute score. And they said <laughs> it needed to be within a certain range um, for it to be you know uh, what they wanted. And he said, 
he he went away and he came back and the next song he wrote was called Jesus 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 because <laughs> he he said I he wasn't gonna listen to anyone telling him what his Jesus per minute score was too high. And <laughs> it, it, that, that's that's actually very that's very fascinating. I just I heard this fascinating uh, a pastor speak at a retreat this this past week and he, he's actually uh, one of the leading um, uh, Protestant pastors in Jerusalem. And uh, he, he studies a lot of Hebraic thought, and he was talking about the way in which we often sever our Christianity from a lot of the things we should have remembered taking from our Old Testament roots. And one is, of course, the repetition, because we're claiming all of time. And the way in which right. Sabbath works, both in terms of, of creation and redemption, is that Note Israel has their own calendar, and we used to, but we thought Constantine was behind that rather than the fact that it is an outgrowth of our connectedness to the Old Testament and the claim of Christ over all time, right? But it's the same thing with entertainment, right? You can only say this in a certain amount of time because that time somehow belongs to someone else other than Christ. And <laughs> right. uh, we see right. Christians recognize, no, no, that in remembering the Sabbath is also remember the one who is Lord over time and to whom every minute belongs. And so entertainment is clearly a part of that stretch in time that ha should have his lordship over it. Right. And I think and I think what we have done is um, as in Christians uh, have fallen prey to it, but also reinforced it is said there's a certain kind of story that's considered Christian. And then there are allowable secular stories and then non-allowable secular stories rather than saying, what does it look like for an artist to be fully committed Christian and out of him, out of his devotion to Christ, right in all of the different genres, uh, yeah. act and produce in all of the different genres of storytelling. Is there anything that Jesus doesn't say that that one's mine? I get that one, right? Is it, um, is, horror something that they do and sometimes they do it in a way that it's okay for us to watch too but mm -hmm. it's the, you know or is it something that christians should say what would a great christian horror movie look like a great christian thriller a great christian police drama you know um uh, or uh, or great christian comedy what does great christian comedy look like i'm i mean reading a really great book on um the the german philosopher uh, haman uh, oh, yeah. And his use his use of humor to fight the Enlightenment, um, yeah. and how the yeah. more secular the Enlightenment got, the less funny it was. But the Christians <laughs> that um, you, that were the ones that basically kept and developed all these different forms of humor. Um, but then the church uh, turned on humor and started to say no. And I think conservatives have a way of <laughs> n not always the, rem thinking. Am I what am I am I conserving the right things? And so they just conserve whatever was in the last generation, even if the last generation was secularly compromised. So they were conserving enlightenment anti humor um, over against the Christians who were fighting that with humor at the time. And so you've got Haman and Kierkegaard, you know, using yeah. a lot of humor oh, um, yeah. uh, over yeah. against uh, the enlightenment guys who were trying to say no humor is. Uh, a debasement of the mind. Yeah. Uh, and that, and See, um, so, yeah. so another, as a comedy writer, I find that stuff really encouraging. <laughs> yeah. An interesting part of that, you know, I think if, if you look at the enlightenment, now you're in my area, <laughs> um, <laughs> history, when, when, when you look at the enlightenment, you look at somebody like Voltaire, um, Candide, it's really funny, but he gets you laughing at all the wrong things. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it, it it's all about tearing down what's there. There's nothing positive that comes out of Voltaire's humor. It's really funny, but right. it doesn't, it doesn't. So, so what, what I'm, I'm, I'm sort of wondering here that in the realm of comedy, you're a comedy writer, um, in the realm of comedy, um, is there a difference between, well, I think there is a difference between satire, which is legitimate and can be very funny, Babylon B. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what, uh, how else should we be thinking about humor besides yeah. a sort of attack? Right. So, yeah, because you've got like um, the ancient comedic comedians, Aristophanes and such, are 
are incredibly destructive and they do what um, now in comedy writing, they, they call it punching down, right? Where they're always making fun of the infirmed, the sick, the, the poor, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a way of, of, of bolstering yourself up. It's, I mean, it's that Greek definition of a hero that you are, um, that because you're the strongest, you're the hero because you know, that it's a, um, not because of who you, not because you have, uh, lifted others up, but because you've pushed others down. And that's that, um, that form of humor, I think is just, um, a, that's a pagan way of using humor, right? Whereas the Christians, like guys like, you know, Haman argues that, uh, that humor is the, the, um, he, he says it's two things. It's the, it's the pathway to salvation because in humor, you have to learn to give yourself up um, right, you, that it's an involuntary response, and so you said humor is one of the ways that uh, God preps our soul for the uh, for the involuntariness of conversion. He was a good Lutheran, um, yeah. and then he, but he also says it's it's the great test of truth, right? Because after a good laugh, the only thing that's still there is the truth. You laugh away falsehood. Um, because of the, the, the usefulness of something, you know, satire, that sort of thing, um, that falsehood can't, can't stand up under the, the scrutiny of humor. Um, whereas, but truth makes it through. So it's, it's that kind of the fiery furnace, um, of finding the truth that humor, uh, for a Christian, that's how, that's how we should be using it. Um, and, and then it's just as a way to serve your neighbor, right? A, a good, um, a, you know, a good laugh is a humbling experience, um, but a humbling experience that you're grateful f- for to having received, right? Because of the involuntary nature of laughter. Well, that that gets me to what I was you know, came to mind as you were talking is uh, how learning to laugh at yourself is a really important part of growing in grace. Uh, being able to see your own foibles, kind of laugh at your own pretension, you know that kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah, you see, you see that say in the Lord of the Rings where you see maybe like Sam in particular every once in a while stop and laugh at himself because he's taking himself too seriously. Right? Yeah, where he's, he says, "Oh, I'm 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 starting to think of myself as some sort of great elf lord, and, yeah, but right. I'm just I'm just Samwise. I'm just the gardener's son." <laughs> right, right. Or, or it's, One, it's, it's, it could be also the kind of laugh that you get when God says, "You know, when you're 900 years old, that you're going to bear a child." Right? <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> <we're, we're, we're, laughs> that that is, and, and God's like, "No, really." <laughs> yeah, 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 right. And, and, well, and, and our Old it, Testament. It, yeah, yeah. Now, in that particular episode. Um, you know, when you think about Isaac and you think about laughter, uh, one of the things that seems to at least characterize a great deal of laughter in the Old Testament is mockery. And so the, there's a sense in which certain things should be mocked. And then uh, that episode with, you know, Sarah and, uh, you know, the Lord, where he says, uh, you're laughing. <laughs> and she says, "No, I'm not." <laughs> and, so, right. and so, and he says, "No, you were." And uh, I'm going to be the last one to laugh. And then she gets the joke, and she enjoys the joke in the end because she has a son at that point. Right. Well, I, yeah. I, I mean, the really. I mean, if you think about it, history is a long form joke. Right, and the devil is God's straight man. The resurrection, <laughs> the, the the resurrection is the punchline, right, yeah. of the joke. Um, yeah. It's the it's the surprise. It's the thing that that people didn't see coming, but then it made perfect sense. You know, it's a really perfect punchline. And then the end of history is a, a callback to the to the central joke, right? So, um, in, in a lot of ways, I think that is our um, the the model of humor. Uh, is I, I think is embedded within the historical narrative of the way, and that and that's how Psalm two describes the resurrection. Right, God sits in the heavens and laughs. Um, <laughs> you, so yeah. so I, I think that I, I think I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking and reading on, on comedy, the history of comedy, um, and the the history. There's a really great. It's not a funny book, but it's the history of Jewish comedy. It's yeah. it's about eight eight hundred pages long, and it's, <laughs> it start and it and and it begins with Esther. It says, but Esther is the the root 
of all Jewish comedy, even to the present. Um, it all go, you know, it all goes it, it, that, that, that theme or that the book of Esther really gives Jewish comedy its structure that it's continued to use. It's why that Jews were the ones who invented stand up comedy. Yeah, it's yeah. why, it, you know, because of, uh, um, the, the book of Esther being formative in the, understanding of who they are in relationship to God um, and how it is that God is going to interact with them. So, I mean, I think that as Christians, comedy should be something that comes natural to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if the book's only 800 pages long, it's the Cliff's Notes for, for <laughs> doing comedy. I mean, yeah. It, 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 yeah. yeah I, remember, I, I remember reading an article not too long ago, it's entitled When Jews Were Funny, and uh it seemed to imply that we've kind of gotten to a place where Jews maybe are taking themselves too seriously uh, at, at right now. Uh, I don't know. In the, in the present, I mean, there's still some really great Jewish comedy writers and comedians um, out there. I think the, I think what it is though, is socialism destroys humor. Yeah. Right? It's, and, it's, it's, um, yeah. and so the, the more that the, the left and the falls prey, I think to socialism that it's just destructive of, Humor, because socialism is so sentimental. Um, it, it's not. It's not. It uh, yeah, it doesn't have a sense of humor. But, but yeah. I remember when I was a kid, uh, all the guys on the left were funny. You know, <laughs> right. you think about something like yeah. uh, Mash, which yeah. was just you know, uh, you know, a lot of fun, a lot of humor, and but no one watches Mash anymore because Klinger. I guess yeah. maybe Klinger yeah. is, is just yeah, so Klinger's, really Klinger's, in, Klinger's in the high school and middle school now. <laughs> yeah, and everybody takes Klinger seriously. Right. Yeah. yeah, Klinger yeah. is no longer funny. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. You well, know. and yeah, you and I think that's the. I mean, if you look at what actually changes and shifts culture. I mean, right now, I'm reading a, um, about halfway through a book called "Homie, Don't Play That," and it's the history of in living color. Um, but it starts by going back to where um, you, that, that you have all of this racial tension that's growing um, in the starting in the '60s into the '70s, and that that the comedians that start to come out of that tension um, are the ones that are able to break through and finally get attention to the tension, right, with their comedy. Um, yeah. And begin to alleviate it, and that that the comedians were the ones that actually cracked open the conscience of America and made it possible to look at that at the the racial problems that you had, especially in New York and and L A. Because uh, you didn't have the same racial problems everywhere, but in New York and L A. you had significant racial uh, problems. Okay. Yeah, Chicago. Yeah. And uh, the but the comedians were the ones that were able to draw people together in order to look at the, the, the problem together and get past it. Right. And so it, it ends up making it possible, um, for things like the Cosby show, um, in living color, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air that really bring, uh, black culture to the forefront, uh, in, in front of people. The it's, Jeffersons. Through, <laughs> the, yeah. The Jeffersons, right. It's through, yeah. it's through, com- it's through comedy that you're able to like humanize, humanize yourself to a, a culture that had that had de- been dehumanizing um, for a lot of people and in a lot of ways. So uh, the comedy is one of the most important ways of changing culture, but you have to actually be funny. You can't go in saying, yeah. I've got a ax to grind and yeah. I'm going to, you know, you have to actually go forward being funny and then yeah. just having convictions, right? And and I think that's where Christians, you know, mo- most of the a lot of entertainment ter- has turned into propaganda now, and yeah. a lot of Christians think, man, if only we were in charge of the propaganda, yeah. right? But, uh, instead of thinking that's a complete misuse of, of storytelling that that's not serving your neighbor. Storytelling is supposed to be a neighbor serving job, um, and. Uh, it, when it when it does that, the convictions of the storyteller come through in the story. You know, so I, I like to tell Christian artists, your job is to get as good at your craft as you can and become as good a Christian as you can, and just grow both those things. And don't worry about making propaganda for the kingdom of God. Worry about art flowing out of you because you are growing in Christ and um, and being good at your craft. Well, yeah, let's, that's, let's uh, jump. J.R.R. Tolkien was. Um, 
someone uh, pointed out, there's a Jesuit who wrote an article who said that uh, the triplex munis Christi, the, the three offices of Christ, are in the Lord of the Rings. You've got the prophet Gandalf, the priest Frodo, who sacrifices himself in a lot of ways, and the, the king Aragorn. And when Tolkien was asked about that, he said, I didn't do that intentionally, but I'm a Christian, and what I believe is inevitably going to come out in my writing. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, exactly, yeah. It's like when they come and they say, hey, who's Tom Bombadil? You know, who's he supposed to be really? He's like, I don't know, Adam maybe, I guess? <laughs> 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 he, he's, he's, a, he's a character, right? You know, right. Um, I mean, he's the greatest character, I think, that Tolkien invented, but he's, he's just a character he invented. But then when asked about it, he goes to the Bible to explain where Tom Bombadil came from, you know. So let, let's talk a little bit about lore and how uh, the model is developing and what you have maybe in the works. It'd be great to kind of build a anticipation and maybe even get people signed up. Yeah, yeah. So wh uh, what lore is, is it is a streaming service, um, but a streaming service where the subscribers get to choose what goes on to the streaming service. So those those that subscribe get to basically vote on what things we end up putting on the platform, um, and they and we do that through a an internal currency system like Candy Crush or um, Fortnite. You know, where there's a, a you, you get loot is what we call it and our internal currency with your subscription and you put it towards the projects that you really like and you want to see. And when they reach the amount that they need, then we send off a check to the artist and send the, and, and it begins to stream on the platform or, or go into production. Um, so it's a, uh, it, and that's how, you know, it's that democratization that we think is going to prove that the audience doesn't want uh, another movie about a horse and a puppy that have cancer um, and, and, and <laughs> then the, the revival <laughs> yeah, the, at the same time. And then they, they cause a revival that helps the high school win football games, you know, or whatever. Um, <laughs> Right, that they actually want uh, diff uh, you know, all sorts of things. And so um, we, have, we, we have gone and gotten a lot of uh, comedic type of things. Our, you know, our most popular show right now is called Barely Biblical, and it's animated stuffed teddy bears acting out the most violent Old Testament Bible <laughs> stories. <laughs> and so um, and that, that's been a really, really popular. And we've got other, other stories, you know, important um, political and cultural stories and, a, as well. Um, uh, but then – you know, we, we've got a, a comedian, uh, one called Breaking Laws with comedian Joseph Granda traveling yeah, the Joseph, country. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Breaking the most ridiculous laws he can find and then turning <laughs> himself into the cops and seeing what they do. Um, and then <laughs> and then he finds a pastor in that town and asks if he broke Romans 13. And it's very funny. <laughs> so so um, and, and, then, and then, you know, uh, we've got up some upcoming shows um, that I think will be. Uh, that'll really stand out, like uh, one called The Lesbian and the Lumberjack. And it's about, uh, it's a, a movie about a woman who thinks she's a lesbian, but it turns out she's just never met a real man. And so, <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've, also got, <laughs> you've also got a horror series on there. Yep, we've got a horror series on there called Dark Holler. It's a true true to life horror series about um, a small church in West Virginia where the pastor suddenly finds himself with this ministry to a um, hundred year old cult um, and uh, you know, having to learn how to do exorcisms and things and it's like that seminary didn't train him for, you know, because <laughs> most seminaries are, most seminaries are, uh, you know, s secretly materialistic and they, yeah. in, in <laughs> practice. Um, yeah, at least, at least when it comes to like, uh, dark spirits, they don't really right. believe in them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so it's a, it's an amazing documentary where they happen to be there filming, um, as, and, and God just opens the door to really begin, um, ministering to people coming out of witchcraft and this really old cult from, from, um, the, the, you, the coal mining days, uh, of, uh, this town in West Virginia, uh, really amazing documentary. It's called dark, dark holler, do a docu-series. Um, and, and, um, Oh, let's, we've got a really great Western, um, uh, called black rose ballad. 
um, that is a just tr- traditional Western, but with a, a spiritual twist that you don't see coming um, to the storytelling. It's so, uh, and then we're, we've got um, adult animation in the works uh, that really pushes back against things like family guy and Rick and Morty. And, um, well, here, here's a funny story. I actually know the chief animator at family guy and he's actually reformed. Really? <laughs> I, any chance I can get a, I can, I, 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 I can connect hard. you with him. No, I can connect you with him and he's probably, he'd probably be interested in talking to you. And, yeah, but I this brings, to talk to him. But this brings up a, 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 a question. Uh, and that is, uh, how do you propose, you know, a project to you guys. Well, so, I mean, that's what I do. That, I'm, I um, vet filmmakers and w- rather than vetting projects directly, we're really, we're trying to find the right kind of filmmaker um, that's willing to, you know, push the boundaries and, and um, you know, do the things that you've always been told you can't do as a Christian in entertainment um, and, and prove that that's, that it's actually not true that we've been, lied to for a long time that pe- that nobody minds if you are have something explicitly christian as long as it's well made right yeah, and right. the problem is that um it's either been not well made or we try to hide we, we try to hide and sneak our christianity in and people don't like that we you know nobody nobody likes it when people are are sneaky um and so instead learn learning to be incredibly good at your craft and then just wor- not worrying about being uh, telling the story the way you want to tell it as a Christian, um, you know. And in, in, in Hollywood, you know, I, I mean, I just finished um, a, a great book called um, "Live from New York." That's a history of Saturday Night Live, and they and the writers the, you had a couple of non-Christian, one kind of anti-Christian writer um, who said, you know, they they would write and um, things, and then Phil Hartman, who was the best actor that they was one of the greatest actors they ever had who was a devout catholic he would just go up and say nope and he but because he was the best at his craft they would remove it right and so he had a number of blasphemous things to just taken off the board that didn't get made simply because he was the best and they knew that he was the best and that if he was gonna if he was gonna um say no then they listened right and they said we they knew it was because of his that he was devoutly catholic um right. and that he didn't want any blasphemy on the show right. um, but they also knew there isn't anybody better and so if he's going to if he's going to say nope and he won't do a sketch then they would just not do the sketch and you think well that's what it looks like to be good enough at your craft and living an explicitly Christian life. Um, yeah. It would have been great if we had people in uh, NIH and uh, the, the CDC. That right. the same. <laughs> they all just well, seem to go along with everything. Yeah, well, there was, you know, there was that. Um, it, yeah, the, the, there, you know, I was just talking to somebody that was working, he works in finance and he's a big wig at a major finance bank. Um, and he, he is very explicitly Christian and he's working on building out, you know, um, Christian groups within the bank all over the place and gathering Christian, all the Christians in the, every building for Bible studies. And, and I said, how do you get away with it? He's like, I bring the most money into the bank of any of the people. So I get <laughs> to do, do what it. I want. Right. He's like, I'm the best. He, he just said, I'm the best at this. You know, right. I'm good at what I do. And so they're not going to, they don't want to lose the money. And so they put up with me, uh, you know, gathering so, the Christians so into the banks. So if somebody wants to pitch something that you would be the guy to talk to, I'd, I'd be the guy to talk to. Yep. They just email, email me and, um, with the, the pitch materials. And then I just, I do zoom meetings basically all day. So another thing would be, you know, how do we subscribe? I mean, where, where do you go to find out about lore and, and sign up for it? Yeah, it's lore.tv, L O O R.tv. And then you just click sign up and it walks you through, <laughs> works you through the process, uh, walks you yeah. through the process. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. now, oh, now Chris. does this mean that you, that you can only watch it on like your phone? Does it mean like you can you can stream it yeah. to your TV? Yeah. Oh well, so it's it's a it's a computer based app right now. The goal is we, we're out looking for investors right now. So if you know any investors, we're also looking for investors um, yeah. to to invest in the tech. Uh, we've got the tech built, but we want to also build apps for the Roku and uh, for Apple TV and all those other apps as well. But we don't have. We won't have those until we find another investor to 
you know, gotcha. build that build that out. But you can stream to your if you've got a smart TV, you can stream it uh, from your computer or your phone onto the TV. Got it. So, Glenn. Yep. Actually, uh, I sent an invitation to Lure TV to you and Tom right when it started. Well, I must have missed <laughs> it in, the, in the, all the things that I get because I do get a lot. <laughs> but well, anyway, at, I, at that point, it was invitation only. I had gotten uh, yeah. one, and I, you know, so I sent that around. Well, now if you now if you send it to them and they sign up, you get twelve hundred bonus loot as well. Uh, so there you go. send it we'll to me to, again. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to, yeah, we'll have to to sign up and uh, get you that loot there, Glenn. <laughs> so uh, now, when it comes to your own work with Lord, are you writing anything, Jason? Are you, are you involved yeah. with just approving stuff? Or are you doing your own stuff? So I've, I've so I've got a um, a couple of things going. I've got a a. Uh, a comedy show called Stand Up Stand Up, where it's clean comedians competing for a um, for a uh, an hour special. Um, so that one will be the the pilot will be dropping soon. Um, we've got a sitcom called The PKs about a pastor's family um, <laughs> using humor to survive the fishbowl of ministry, um, at, <laughs> starring the uh, rapper Show Baraka, who's a brilliant actor. Um, that one we filmed the pilot, and so it'll be in round two. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I am overseeing a, se a series of animated shorts called, um, fridge magnet that is experimental animated shorts, uh, where we've got, you know, um, uh, one, a hyper violent Samson and the uh, jawbone of an ass, uh, cartoon. That's really incredible. Um, we've got, uh, one called, um, Sounds like kind of like a Samurai Jack kind of. Thing. It is. That's very. It's in that same. It's in the. But in the 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 last season of Samurai Jack, where they have the the, the more experimental animation. Um, <laughs> Got it. So uh, and then we have uh, you, you know things like um, uh, uh, trad Chad and wifey, where it's a a, um, a, a, a a married a married couple whose superpower is traditional gender roles. <laughs> they're huge, and they use traditional gender roles to uh, save marriages in the neighborhood. It's very funny. Um, <laughs> so, that sounds great. Uh, yeah, it would be great if so they that, were that kind of experimental animation. <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. I like. Maybe I should do that. Maybe start calling myself uh, Trad Chad or Chad. Yeah, Trad. Trad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's but it's the it's similar. To, you know, um, so Family Guy and Rick and Morty and even The Simpsons started as experimental short. Yeah. Um, and, and so we're trying to do something similar where you put, put experimental shorts out in front of people and find the ones that really resonate and then build, and you can build an audience for, and then, you know, go out and make long, long form, um, versions of it. Cause there's not really any, there aren't Christians, um, that have gone out and really taken dominion in that comedic space. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and fought back, you know, so yeah. and I, th I think we really need to uh, be doing that. Would you like to establish a privatized banking system that will help you separate from the mainstream banks and get more control over your money? Join a growing community of families, business owners, pastors and churches, yes, even churches that are learning to establish and manage a privatized banking system and enjoy the safety of guaranteed tax-free growth perpetuated by the amazing power of uninterrupted compound interest. Don't wait for the next crash. Contact Private Family Banking. They are here to help fuel the future of the family and the church with multi-generational wealth building. See our contact information in the show notes below or just email us at banking at privatefamilybanking.com. So it sounds like you're getting artists, you're getting material, but you're like still looking for the investors. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, we, so we've been so, able to build the tech with, we, we went out and got a little bit of investment. Um, I mean, for the tech world, it's a might, we got a micro investment basically. Um, but because none of us are trying to be millionaires and draw huge salaries, we've been able to build the technology on almost no money. Uh, but now in order to really pour gasoline on it and get the marketing going, and now that we've got the, the tech built and proved, uh, we're trying to find some um, investment uh, from somebody that can say, you know, you know we're, we're looking for uh, 1.6 million. Um, gotcha. to, now, now, obviously, there are lots of folks out there looking for funding. Uh, but uh, is there something about what you're doing that maybe makes this particularly challenging? 
because uh, my guess is that your 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 typical sort of uh, you know older successful uh, wealthy person. Uh, is being hit up by the Billy Graham Association every day, you know yeah. that kind of stuff. And there, and there's my guess is that maybe the kind of thing you're doing isn't quite what they're used to being asked to fund. Right? Yeah, I think that's what it is. I think that um, that they partly because we've said we re, we are going after the 16 to 35 year old male that doesn't want to see strangers naked, right? That's our, that's who we're trying to serve. That's not the norm for Christian media, right? So we're already outside of the norm. And then we've built a video game interface. And so a lot of older folks don't understand the video game interface. You know, video game is an $89 billion industry a year. Um, but only about 12 billion of that is spent on the actual video games. The rest is on in-game purchases. And we've built a system the basically exactly like candy crush with in-game purchases and so it's a and so a lot of older christians are like i don't really play video games i don't understand so well but it's because we're going after a demographic that has already been trained on how to use that sort of technology well well, this 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 is a really interesting wrinkle and i'd like to explore this a little bit with you so i've got you know some background in the publishing world and one of the things that christian publishing in particular uh, has catered to because that's where the money is for traditional books is the female audience. Right. So you go to your typical Christian bookstore and there's maybe one shelf of material that would have any appeal to, you know, any guy with a little testosterone. And the rest of the place is just full of like, I don't know, uh, precious moments kind right. of wannabe stuff. And Christian you know, cleaned up version of Harlequin romance. You yeah, know? You, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you, you can have Harlequin romances so long as you've got Amish girls on the cover. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> right? so, so, so basically, <laughs> this, yeah, so right. basically uh, we, I, we have this, I, hu- this huge uh, uh, audience of, of guys who are completely out of touch with most Christian publishing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like to call those bonnet busters, right? Instead of bonnet busters. <laughs> but then, yeah, the, um, yeah, so the, the, the Christian um, media empire that was built in the 90s was built on the back of family Christian bookstores. Um, yeah, you know, that, fun, yeah, yeah. And where you would go in, and I mean, the VHS kept going in Christian bookstores long after it was gone <laughs> everywhere else um, be, because we're so behind the times, but also the, the, it, it's the 40 year old soccer mom that shops at those places. And so um, that was for a long time. They thought, well, that's where the money is, is that 40 year old soccer mom. And it was, there was good money to be made there, which, and it's fine to serve those folks, but that's the, the entire distribution market was, focused there. And then, um, what happened was they started, um, saying, Oh, if we go to theaters and we can convince churches to buy out a theater and hand out the tickets, (coughs) excuse me, then we'll have that. That's a good way to make money. But then you're really not serving an audience uh, of general population. You're serving the audience of the pastor. What kind of movie does the pastor want his congregation to see? So it's a false, um, demographic, uh, it's not, and, and unfortunately most pastors are soccer moms, even if they're not physically, they are but, spiritually, you know, you, know, let's, let's, you know, go ahead, Glenn. Pull, pulling this back a few decades to the family bookstore era and maybe a little bit before, um, Kemper Crab, whom we mentioned earlier, um, has an album, uh, the group is called Atomic Opera, uh, the album is called Gospel Cola, and the first song is called Jesus Junk. Okay. <laughs> and I listened to this, and my first reaction was, oh, so this is why this isn't played on K-Love. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. So, well, and there, there have been, you know, in the 90s, you had the attempt to break out with play, things like Tooth and Nail Records um, and 
that forced air one to begin to exist, you know, some alternative Christian radio. Um, but it still was gatekeeper centric. Um, Christian hip hop in the, in the early two thousands was really quick to begin using other distribution sources, um, and has p- paved the way. And for a lot of ways of what we're trying to do, um, it, it, in the sense that it's trained an audience to say, well, I don't have to go to Caleb. There's other ways to get, to find Christian art. Um, so the, we owe a lot to, I think the Christian hip hop artists with that do it yourself aesthetic, um, and mindset that said, we'll build out our own distribution models. Um, but there's nothing like that for movies and television yet. Yeah. That gets me thinking about the fact that, uh, art forms that, become enormous uh begin on the periphery uh so if you think about yeah. like comic books comic books there there was like no place that we had, was kind of like lower on the scale of cultural uh respectability than comics in the like 30s and 40s right. <laughs> you know and, yeah, and that's <laughs> and that was the era in which things like batman and superman and the captain america got started and now you can't like get any money for a movie unless it's a you know, based on a comic book. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, and, and I mean, I, I think Chris, we've talked about this a little bit. We've got our favorite comics that we continue to go to, but there, those IP, the IP, you know, Marvel was a hundred years old before they got Howard the duck, which is their first <laughs> yeah, Marvel yeah. movie. Right. It's a, um, right. You, it, you don't get the Avengers without multiple generations, just like, yeah. you know, Disney is the same sort of way. It's, you, um, it's, um, uh, but it all starts on the periphery, um, yeah. under, you know, that, the, that under those underground movements. And you know, even, even if you look at, at, um, something like the, the black comedy that now kind of dominates the mainstream, um, it started in, you know, in places like the Apollo and, and, yeah. um, the, the comedy store, Tuesday night comedy store, you know, black comic night. And it was a, a place where you would go and if you weren't good enough, you would get booed off stage, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Booed off stage within 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and that crucible is what created the great comics that we ended up finally seeing when they broke out into the mainstream in the mid nineties in the early two thousands. But Christians don't, we're not willing as artists to go into the crucible for one or to create crucibles because the church comic scene People are too nice. I mean, yeah, right. The, you know, if somebody shows up, we don't boo somebody off stage if they're bad. And I think we need to create those Christian yeah. underground Christian comic areas where you really do boo somebody off stage. Yeah. And they're yeah. they're they're there. I mean, I I was at a conservative comedy show in L.A. Um, where the you know the guy guy gets up on stage and he made an off color joke and everybody groaned and booed and he switched his act right midstream to less of that because the and the christians were there in the audience um and they were willing to you know voice like ah don't and, and the guy's a really funny writer um and he had other material and he switched to it you know right, but right. um the, the, but we don't create that crucible that it takes to get great underground art that can break out and you know. does does it does it have something to do with the fact that kind of the larger ethos of the evangelical world since the mid nineteenth century has been largely controlled by those soccer mom types? I, I think so, and I think you know niceness has taken over as the the premier virtue, um, and I, and I don't think that helps artists very much. Um, <laughs> well, I think I mean, about you, the, yeah, you I think, think about the divine comic. Uh, yeah. Go, you think about the Divine Comedy. There's a lot of skewering and uh, right. going on in there. I mean, you know, you, you have Dante like sending his enemies to hell and torturing them. Right. <laughs> go ahead, go I ahead, mean, Tom. And sticking, I mean, he was sticking the pope, sticking the pope in hell, and all that. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, well, it's like I, like I, Fellini's. I, the Fellini has in the in Roma. I mean, whatever you think of Fellini, <laughs> the brilliant scene of the Pope's fashion show, right? <laughs> and well, he has he has this guy coming out in this long long pa- you know cl- clergy wear called "Skate Your Way to Heaven." <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean you, you talk about brilliant humor and satire yeah. and everything else, just in this in this this small little episode you don't even have to be you know 
you don't even have to overstep on, on, on you know, to, to communicate that. But I think your point, I just wanted to back up that notion of virtue and, and selective virtues being promoted, usually catering to, like you said, certain kind of sensitivities. And I think that's been part of our losses, the, the wider range of virtue emphasis um, especially those that are, are naturally tied to to men and 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 the kinds of things that are at the heart. I mean, remember, you know, one of the big criticisms, if not things that leave one out on that final day, is cowardice, right? <laughs> right. And I think good humor has that risk of fearlessness to step into territory that is uncomfortable and yet able to communicate without having to degrade itself. And that requires a lot of formation of one's soul to be able to walk that fine line. Because you can hear crass kind of, you know, oh, slip in a bad word or, you know, just try to get a laugh out of making a sexual, you know, comment. But it just, it just ends up becoming so reductionistic, boring, formulaic but when somebody is able to really tap into that that fine line, I think that's where you get your brilliant art, you get your brilliant music, you get your your brilliant comedy, and and that fostering of excellence. I think um, part of what you said, the the audience c- kind of playing into when it's not hitting the mark of excellence. I think it, it's that's a that's a big insight. Yeah, I w- when you're talking about. Um uh, courage, um, you know, with Dante putting the Pope in hell and things like that. The one that's usually overlooked is Michelangelo. Uh, he put the mouth of hell right in front of the Pope. Um, in other words, when the Pope is saying mass at the altar, he is looking at the mouth of hell. And <laughs> there are two ways to interpret this. One of them, now this was done for a Pope that Julius II, Michelangelo wasn't especially fond of Julius. <laughs> um, but so you you could either view this as as alerting the Pope to the seriousness of what he's doing because maybe he doesn't take it too seriously, or you could see it as a preview of coming attractions. <laughs> <laughs> Was there I'm a, not sure which uh, one Michelangelo meant meant to be honest. Yeah. Was there a movie? Um, made about their relationship. Agony in the um, Ecstasy. Yeah, the Agony in the Ecstasy. That was an incredible movie. Um, yeah, the, that I, I need to go look at that. And I, that's, well, it could be, that's it could new be to inspiration for writing one in relationship to the current Pope. But anyway, <laughs> well, I, 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 I'll stay so out of that. The, the TV show that I had in development with uh, with a Netflix producer when COVID happened, and then. You know, it it all fell apart, and my option expired. And but it was it's called Dante, and it's a high school senior navigating the nine levels of high school hell. <laughs> and it's a it's a high school comedy, but it's the Dante's right. Inferno reset in a high school, with the right. idea being that it's you know you know because Dante it's is about how your you the actions that you have when you that sin already has embedded within it the beginning of the punishment. Of sin, right? right. That, that hell is embedded within the act of the sin itself um, right. in advance. And so, what does it look like for a high schooler to learn how their actions, you know, their that their actions are the um, have an eschaton, you know, that. Um, right. And so right. it's, but but if you write it in a comedy, then they're happy to watch it, right? They're happy to, right. you know, right. uh, yeah. Hor- uh, Horace says, uh, "He who entertains." best teaches most <laughs> yeah. yep. so but you know um you can make an argument that charlie and the chocolate factory is mm. dante yeah oh so so that's how a, many yeah how many kids amazing. were there that got that 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 were brought into the factory was it five or seven or i'm just trying to remember i can't the remember but that's but you're totally right like yeah the, the that the way um that it's you know, as each one comes in, they've got their vice, and as they, when they refuse to turn away from their vice, they're swallowed up by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that's true with uh, you know Roald Dahl. You know Roald Dahl. He he, uh, he obviously was an interesting guy for many reasons, but one of those tends to be the moral character of his stories. 
Yeah. And, and sort of the, you, you, you can think about even the grotesque elements uh, yeah. as being uh, very much in keeping with kind of medieval, yeah. uh, you know, pl- you know, theater. Yeah. Well, his, <laughs> his, the stuff he wrote for adults is almost like a British oh, Flannery wow. O'Connor. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, I've, I've, I've read his short stories, that, you know, for adults and they are super creepy. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and I, I I I don't write horror well, but I love good solid horror. Um, you know that that because it requires an, a moral, a fundamental moral foundation. Um, yeah, you you know for you know to, when a, for it to work. Yeah, you know that in any horror film that's got like teenagers in it, it's the good looking like really nasty kids that are going to get yeah, it bad. Yeah, they're yeah. going to get it right out <laughs> right out the gate. You know, they're going down first. <laughs> Actually, a guy at the Colson Center um, made an argument a while years ago. I heard him talking about this. This was back in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer days and all. He said that that one of the core things in the horror movies of that period, I don't know if it still holds true, is that at the root of the, well, the, the story is some kind of sexual transgression. Mm-hmm. And it plays out as a, um, as a morality tale uh, about vengeance over that. Right, yeah, <laughs> 80s and 90s horror, that whole era... Is that is people trying to come to grips with the fact that you that the that societal um, expectations about sex have stopped uh, enforcing the boundaries, right? And so now, what you know, what are we gonna, what are we releasing? What monster are we releasing? Yeah. Well, now um, we now and then they're punished by Freddy or they're, the cha- the chainsaw <laughs> yep. guy. Yeah. So yeah. let, let, let's think a little bit about genre and think about the kinds of stuff you're looking for. So do you get a lot of one kind of thing and not enough of another? What's what's it like? Yeah, we don't get enough sci-fi, and that's our most requested genre. So um, it, and for whatever reason, Christians um, are not – haven't figured out how to charge in and try and write good, solid Christian sci-fi – and I think some of that, you know, you look at something like Star Trek and there's no, re- there isn't, the religion is gone in, in the future. Yeah. And um, so you've got other examples of the, where like Firefly, I think, is a better example of something that a Christian could have written or written on um, because there is still, you know, religion is still fundamentally a part of the Christian, of the human experience. And I don't, you know, there's, then there's not even really aliens in Firefly. There's only distorted versions of Christians um, it's more like a Cordwainer Smith type of universe. Yeah, yeah. Cordwainer Smith was great. Yeah. Now, now well, there's a guy a who was a believer. There aren't any aliens. <laughs> they've, they've, never, they've never discovered aliens when they went out. That was actually a point that was made in one of the episodes. Okay, that's what I was thinking, I, but I couldn't quite remember. The, um, the, what the, the, the monsters out there are reavers, which are people who have been – because of a government experiment gone wrong, have have turned into a society of sociopaths. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's a is it's an example of you know full blown communism. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. a couple couple of uh, writers, you know, you got Hyperion, you know, the, those stories which have a very strong Christian sort of undercurrent in them. Uh, what was it, Dan? Was it Dan Simmons who wrote Hyperion? I don't know. If, I, I'm not I, sure. I, yeah. But uh, another one would be, Cord- as you noted, Cord Wiener Smith. Yeah. Cord Wiener Smith stuff is very uh, significantly Christian in sort of character in s- certain s- senses. But I want to bring up something that I'd like for you to consider with regard to classic Trek. I agree with you in terms of the more contemporary or some more recent uh, kind of iterations of Star Trek. But uh, Gene Roddenberry was a kind of liberal Christian. Um, and if you go back and you look at the, the classic Trek uh, episodes that make explicit reference to Christianity, and there are a few, uh, they're actually very, uh, I, I guess, uh, pro-Christian in the in Oh, the, interesting. Because I was raised on tra- Star Trek The Next Generation. Like, that was yeah. my, yeah, the, my childhood. So. so there's this particular episode. When you think about, for example, uh, what you have in Kirk. So James Tiberius Kirk, his name— his last name actually means church. Yeah, and uh, his his middle name is is you know the Ro- the Greco Roman Roman emperor. And then you've got James the Just, who is the brick. And so you've got these two tributaries that f- that create the church. But there's a particular episode where this come, becomes really very sort of 
uh, explicit the 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 enterprise comes to a planet that's in in in, a, in the same sort of technological stage as the 20th century of earth but the roman empire is still there and uh. they and they and they 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 get a tele they get a televised gladiatorial combat <laughs> and they actually see you know somebody killed on television to you know the thrill of the audience kind of like mma but gone way out <laughs> yeah. you know and, and, and there, but there <laughs> but there is a cult known as the the sun worshipers and in the episode you you think that initially that these people are worshiping the sun in the sky but it turns out they're worshiping the son of god and that's actually christianity is emerging on the planet hmm. oh wow okay i remember yeah. that episode i remember yeah. seeing it when it was first aired actually yeah yeah <laughs> i am yeah. that old <laughs> <laughs> that was like 1966 yeah. there <laughs> yeah well, even even i wasn't around <laughs> <laughs> anyway the, um, but a, a quick go ahead, go Go ahead, a quick source for people, it, 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 for those who kind of have a, a philosophical bent, but Stephen R. L. Clark, who is he's a Christian uh, philosopher. He writes a lot on Plotinus and different. He again, he's a Christian who does philosophy. He's not simply doing Christian philosophy. But he wrote a great because he loves sci-fi, and he finally wrote a book called "How to Live Forever: Science Fiction and Philosophy." Stephen R. L. Clark. It's a, it's a brilliant work, and for anyone who kind of, maybe if they're not ready to write, at least kind of get a grasp at, at somebody who's thought about these things and, and loves, you know, you get a lot of interaction with good science fiction in, 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 the, in the work. Well, you, you, oh, you, you, to, that one sounds good. I'll have to read that one. Have you, are you familiar with Canticle for Leibowitz? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. yeah I, I mean, and um, he, the, that same author has uh, a... A uh, series of short stories called Dark Benedictions. Oh, I um, didn't know that. Oh, amazing. Um, hmm. And you know, because he's he's devout Roman Catholic right. and has some really great um, sci fi. Uh, Martin? What, no, what's his? Walter. Yeah, I'm Walter. I'm drawing a blank on him, too. But people can look at it. It's, it's, it's actually one of the most popular books, Canticle for Leibowitz, when you see mm -hmm. collections of the greatest works of science fiction. Yeah. It's often included. I read, and, I read it once a year. That's one of my favorites. Okay. Well, yeah. nice. Well, we, we should probably wrap things up here. It's been great to have this conversation with you, Jason. Is there anything, though, you might want to make certain that uh, listeners know about before we close up uh, the episode? I mean, if, if you have um, – yeah, if if there are Christian artists out there, um, I would love to connect with them. Um, and then, uh, yeah, good. Go to loor TV and sign up. And uh, the the um, we've we've we can prove that uh, great Christian art uh, works if we come together and you know and see that it gets made. So it's out there. Nice, nice. Anyway, anything you guys want to say as we conclude, uh, Glenn or Tom? No, it's, it, I mean, I think we covered we covered a lot, and I think yeah. it gives yeah. our audience enough to digest. But this is great stuff, really. I'm yeah, very proud really of what is. you're up to. Yeah. And thank you uh, for listening to the Theology Podcast and making it all the way to the end of the episode so that now you get it, you get to hear me make a pitch for Patreon. <laughs> we appreciate uh, all the folks who support us on Patreon. We've had about a half a dozen new uh, supporters just in the last month or so, and we're really pleased to have them uh, part of the team. And uh, obviously, we're building out the, the show uh the funds that we use, we don't get. Uh, Tom and Glenn and I, we eat, I eat basically ramen noodles every day. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have to pay the people who produce the show. And uh, so uh, uh, we know that uh, they appreciate it when they're paid. And uh, consequently, uh, when you help us out through Patreon, that helps that to happen. So thank you very much for, for doing that. Anyway, that's enough for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy another one of our podcasts, Got a Minute, featuring Larson Hicks and Rich Lusk. Theology, philosophy, economics, politics, and more for normal people.